Chapter 16 Point K The Man Who Would Be Bought Manipulating key placement into positions of political power in any country is a complex challenge, but one in which the secret elite were well practiced. The radical French Prime Minister Joseph Kayok, who had instigated diplomatic neg negotiations with Germany and resolved the crisis over Ajadir, had to be replaced. His belief that our true policy is an alliance with Germany was incompatible with secret elite plans. Cayo and his enemies, Cayo had many enemies, but none more deadly than Alexander Izvolsky, the principal foreign agent of the secret elite. Though he had given up his post as Russian foreign secretary in 1910, and moved from St. Petersburg to Paris. As the Russian ambassador, Izvolsky had not been demoted or reduced in rank. His principal roles were to coordinate war preparation between Russia and France and help corrupt French politics. Izvolsky was provided with substantial funds to bribe the French press into turning public opinion against Caillot and like-minded politicians. A right-wing Ravenchist lawyer, Raymond Poincare, was selected as the man to replace Caillot and lead France to war. Born in Lorraine, Poincare was consumed by hatred of Germany and harbored a fierce determination to regain the province for France. He later conceded, I could discover no other reason why my generation should go on living except for the hope of recovering our lost provinces. Be clear about this. From the outset, Poincare knew that he was funded and supported by outside agencies to turn France against Germany. He was fully aware that he owed his political success to hidden forces that sponsored his rise to power in France. He sold his soul to the secret elite in order to regain Alsace-Lorraine. Poincaré was personally involved in the bribing of the French press, advising Izvolsky on the most suitable plan for distri of distribution of the subsidies. Subsidies, indeed. This was outright corruption in its most blatant form. French newspaper editors were paid large sums of money to subject Caillou to a torrent of abuse. Vilifying Caillou, they alleged that he had negotiated with the Kaiser behind the back of his ministerial colleagues, ministerial colleagues, and needlessly conceded French colonial territory in Africa to Germany. Ravenchist and the Senate quite ludicrously portrayed the African bushland bushlands Caillou had given up in return for European peace as a second Alsace-Lorraine, torn from the bleeding body of France. Under immense personal and political pressure, Caillou resigned in January of 1912. Poincaré was elected as prime minister and foreign minister, and for the first time, France was committed to the Ravenchist cause. It was a pivotal moment in European history. The new Prime Minister of France owed everything to Izvolsky and his controllers. Within hours of his installation, Poincaré went to Izvolsky's office to assure him of France's absolute solidarity with Russia. Note the sequence of events. The Prime Minister immediately went in person to see Izvolsky rather than the ambassador being called to the prime minister's office. This clearly proved who called the shots in the relationship. Poincaré was a bought man who fully understood his indebtedness and did everything but kiss the dapper little Russian's hands. From the start, he carefully fashioned French foreign policy to meet Sir Edward Grey's approval, and it was the British Foreign Office that he looked for direction. After two frustrating years dealing with anti-war politicians in Paris, Alexander Zvolsky was overjoyed. 
He wrote elated to Sergei Sazonov, Sazonov, his own chosen replacement at the Russian Foreign Office, that the French War Ministry was now energetically preparing for military operations in the very near future, and that Poincaré intended to discuss these matters with him as frequently and as thoroughly as possible. Some weeks later, Zvolsky informed Sazonov that Poincaré's first concern was to prevent a German movement for peace. Under his direction, the nature of the Franco-Russian agreement changed from a defensive alliance to open support for aggressive Russian intervention in the Balkans. Furthermore, Poincaré had assured Izvolsky that France would give Russia armed support if she became involved in a war with Austria and Germany. With Poincaré in power, Izvolsky was renewed in his purpose, and the chronicle of the two years that followed in is the story of their victory over all opposition in France and Russia. They, co they cooperated and assisted each other to attain their personal dreams. The return of Alsace-Lorraine to France and Russia control over Constantinople and the Straits. Poincaré's legal skill and forceful personality saw him dominate the French cabinet and from the first day of his premiership he pursued an anti-German foreign policy that had been given no explicit public approval. He, has, he was faced with one particular problem. George Louis, the French ambassador in St. Petersburg, one of France's most able diplomats, was staunchly against war. Ambassador Louis was aware of the change in nature of the Franco-Russian alliance and spoke out strongly against it. Henceforth, his days were numbered. Raymond Poincaré was not particularly subtle. In April of 1912, he curtly rejected German overtures of friendship. He was perplexed about Haldane's mission to Germany, but the British Foreign Office quietly reassured him that nothing had changed and reminded him how the Entente worked in practice. Nothing could be committed to writing. Secret agreements of such a magnitude between Britain and France and Britain and Russia had to remain unwritten. Thereafter, Poincaré appeared entirely comfortable with verbal assurances from London, speaking with studied, ad speaking with studied admiration of the late British monarch. He noted that King Edward regarded it as entirely super superfluous to set down in writing the understanding between powers. Be certain that he did. Izvolsky was able to report back to Sazanov in June of 1912 that neither France nor England has caused, has caused to desire modification of present relations. Signature of this or that other formal document would not reinforce in any manner this guarantee. You can almost hear King Edward's calm reassurance through these very words. In reality, there was greater harmony and mutual confidence between France and Britain, though they were only friends than between France and Russia with their formally signed treaty. The commitment was absolute, yet Asquith and Gray continued to deny solemnity, solemn, solemnity, sol, solely, deny solemnly in Parliament that Britain had any secret agreements that bound her to participate in a continental war. When Russia was deliberately and steadily fomenting trouble in the Balkans in August of 1912, Poincaré visited St. Petersburg to assure Sazonov of, of French and British support and to, and to conclude further military agreements. The French Prime Minister was accompanied everywhere by Zvolsky, while Ambassador George Louis was pointedly kept well away, well away from the discussions. They did not trust their own ambassador with policy changes to which they knew he would object. Poincaré 
promised Sazonov that France would allow Russia into a war with Germany and assured him that England was ready to come to France's aid with her military and naval forces. The French War Plan, Plan 17, detailed the elaborate provisions already in place for the British Expeditionary Forces, transport the Expeditionary Forces' transportation and concentration on the Belgian frontier. Poincaré begged Sazonov to preserve the most absolute secrecy in regard to the information. The other matter that required attention was finance. Russia remained desperately short of capital for war preparations. During his visit, Poincaré pointedly linked financial support from France to an increase in the efficiency of the crucial Russian railway lines leading to the frontiers with Germany. He was particularly insistent that the time scale required for mobilization and advance of the Russian army towards the Polish-German border had to be reduced to a minimum. French capital was also to be used for specific war enterprises in Russia such as naval construction, armament production, railway carriages, and the infrastructure to move everything effectively. A major Paris bank, El Union Paris. Parisian, Parisian, was the principal vehicle for such of the funding, for much of the funding. Linked as it was to the Rothschilds through Baron Anthony the Rothschild, this had all the hallmarks of secret elite funding for Russia's war machine. Given that Russia had serious problems maintaining its own internal investments, Izvolsky's capacity to find funds to promote secret elite objectives is worthy of examination. By the onset of the First World War, 80% of direct Russian government debt was held in Paris. When they tried to arrange a flotation of railway securities at half a billion francs annually, Poincaré's government gave approval based on certain promises that the Russian army had to be increased and construction of designated strategic railroads up to the German border, which had been agreed in advance with the general staff. French general staff was required to begin immediately. Despite its name, the center point of French, the center point of French banking was not the Bank of France. It was an organization controlled by a handful of private banks, amongst which two were more powerful than all the others combined. The Haute Banks of Mirabord and Rothschild. Indeed, the Rothschilds and their relatives were consistently on the board of regents of the Bank of France. Investment banks, the first line source of funding, were dominated by the Rothschilds Bank de Paris et de Paribas and the Banquet de, de l Union Parisien, a nominal rival. Though separate, they frequently shared directors. The Rothschilds Paribas Bank controlled the all powerful news agencies, Havas, which in turn owned the most important advertising agency in France. Like Lord Natty Rothschild in London, Baron Edward de Rothschild in Paris controlled massive swaths of global investment banking. The London and Paris cousins worked in tandem so that the funds that flowed to Russia were strictly directed to the war aims of the secret elite. The large amounts of money Izvolsky used to corrupt French politics and the French press appeared to come from Russia. It did, but only via a, circum, a, circuitous, a circuitous route. The slush fund was siphoned off from the huge loans that were transferred there from France. This indirect funding structure meant that the money was borrowed in Paris at a cost to the Russian taxpayers and redirected back to France to provide Izvolsky's slush fund. It was a clever system whereby all of the loan debt and the interest accrued on it was ultimately repaid by the Russian people. 
Poincaré understood enough about the power of money to change the banking rules in 1912 so that any applications for international loans had to be approved through himself as foreign minister. This allowed him to work closely with all of the bankers to whom he directed and indirectly owed his position, where he directly and indirectly owned, owed his positions, owed his position and channeled the funds required by Russia and Serbia to prepare for war. Poincaré had made an impressive start in international politics and his commitment to a shared cause made him an invaluable asset to the secret elite. They were, however, conscious of his vagaries of French politics. Prime ministers tended to come and go with vulgar repetitiveness, and there had been six, there, and there had been six incumbents over the previous six years. The post of president, on the other hand, was guaranteed for a seven-year period. The presidency would thus offer Poincaré and, by default, the secret elite a greater permanence to pursue their war agenda. They enthusiastically backed his candidacy, candidacy in 1912, the presidential election against an avowed anti-war, anti-Russian opponent, Emil Combs. The choice was stark and as Volsky understood the absolute necessity of securing Poincaré's election, he urgently telegraphed Sazanov for further funds to bribe the press and members of the Senate and Chamber of Deputies, telling him, should Poincaré fail, which God forbid, it will be a disaster for us. The sums involved were enormous. Izvolsky requested 3 million francs alone to buy off the radical a paper owned by one of Poincaré's most outspoken opponents in the Senate. The money was passed directly by Zvolsky to an intermediary and on to which, and on to the French Minister of Finance, Louis Lucien Klotz, who shamelessly dis- dispersed it to the politicians who would effectively vote for Poincaré. The general public did not at the time vote for the, their president, Electors were, limit, electors were limited to senators and deputies, which made bribery and corruption relatively straightforward. The secret elite went to great lengths to ensure that the money could, be, could not be tra- traced back to Russia, or worse still, to Paris and London. Poincaré's opponents were bribed to vote for him, and opposition was silenced. Nothing was left to chance. Congress duly elected Poincaré on the thir- February 13, 1913, and the fate of Europe was sealed. Traditionally, the president had been seen as merely a figurehead, but Poincaré's first act was to award himself much greater powers. In his inaugural address, he declared that he would play a more active part in politics than his predecessors and radically altered the philosophy of the French government. The the diminution of executive power is desired neither by the chamber nor by the nation. It is not possible for a people to be really peaceful except on the condition of always being ready for war. His dictatorial approach was underlined by the immediate removal of George Louis from his ambassadorial post in St. Petersburg. The late King Edward's chosen agent, Theophile de Casse, the most rapidly anti-German politician in French public life, replaced him. His Volsky telegraphed St. Petersburg, de Casse is entirely devoted to the idea of the very close association between Russia and France. He is empowered to offer Russia all the financial assistance required in the form of railway railway loans. The new president meant business. Raymond Poincaré altered the regulations which determined the composition of France's Supreme War Council, giving himself the power to convene the council under his own chamber chairmanship, he announced a well-funded campaign to introduce a military service law that extended the period of national service 
from two to three years and dramatically increased the size of France's standing army. The North Northcliffe Press enthousi enthusiastically backed the plan. In London, the Times ran a passionate campaign in support of Poincaré's three-year law and poured ridicule on its opponents like the socialist Jean Joris. The Times correspondent in St. Petersburg reported with simultaneous changes in the Russian army, their peacetime footing would be 1,400,000. He, bold, he boldly claimed that by general consent, the Russian army has never been in better condition, though that itself has yet to be put to the test. These changes gave the Franco-Russian military forces an enormous numerical advantage over the United German and Austrian armies. On the 12th of November, 1913, Baron Guillaume, the Belgian ambassador in Paris, warned his foreign ministry in Brussels that Poincaré's exorbitant expenditure on the French army posed an alarming dilemma. France would either renounce what she cannot bear to forego, Alice Alsace-Lorraine, or else go to war at short notice. Clearly, Poincaré was not preparing for the former. Goulamé noted that infatuation with the military had created a kind of popular frenzy and that French people were not allowed to express doubt about the three-year law under pain of being marked as a traitor. The propaganda, which had been carefully planned and executed, began by helping to get Poincaré elected president and continued regardless of the dangers that it is creating. There is great anxiety throughout the country. The French people were right to be anxious. Raymond Poincaré proved to be a worthy investment for the secret elite. He put reconciliation with Germany to the sword, prepared his nation for war, and declared unswervingly loyal, unswerving loyalty to Britain and Russia. Guided by his Volsky, he stood ready to manipulate unrest in the Balkans and take advantage of the crisis to provoke a European war, the war he wanted so much, the war that would win back his beloved lost provinces. Boincaire's election had been secured through bribery corruption, and a huge investment in influencing public opinion through the press. This classic control of the levers of power, which Carol Quigley so rightly described as the secret elite's trademark, was not limited to Europe, but was simultaneously being manipulated in the United States of America. Summary, Chapter 16, Point Care, The Man Who Would Be Bought. The secret elite used their principal agent in Paris, Alexander Zvolsky, to undermine Prime Minister Joseph Cario and have him replaced by a rabid, ravenous Raymond Poincaré. Poincaré knew that he was indebted to Zvolsky and foreign bankers, newspapers, and politicians who funded his corrupt campaign. Under Poincaré, the nature of the Franco-Russian alliance was fundamentally committed to war, not defense. Thus, he visited Sazonov in St. Petersburg to reassure him of French and British commitment to war with Germany. By 1914, over 80% of Russian debt was owed to French banks. Poincaré and his backers insisted that these loans were conditional on increases in the Russian was con were conditional on increases in the Russian military and a modernized railway infrastructure that would speed up mobilization against Germany F the french banks and the bank of france were controlled by very few major financiers amongst whom the rothschilds were a dominant power the House of Rothschilds in London and Paris worked in tandem to service the loans required for Russia through other bank fronts. Other banking fronts. 
point, Kerr's position as prime minister was relatively insecure, so the secret elite promoted his election to president in 1913 through a massive program of bribery and corruption. Once elected, Poincaré immediately increased the powers of the president, sacked his more pacifist ambassador in Russia, George Lewis, and replaced him with the ravenous champion, Del Casse. Much to the approval of the secret elite, Poincaré introduced a three-year law to increase the strength of the French army.